Welcome to Frankly Speaking with Dr. Wade. This show was created for and inspired by the thousands of patients I've served. So it's time for me to speak up and speak out on their behalf. With a wide range of experts, we bring you weekly insights, diving deep into topics of controversy to bust through the sugar coating that keeps you and your family stuck in the mainstream. Good day, everybody. Today, I'm excited to talk about these five keto myths. Um, number one, I'm a keto guy, but I am really keto smart is my point. Um, and I'm not trying to egoically say I'm keto smart or mine's the smartest way. I'm just talking about how I see the ketogenic diet when it's applied properly. It's actually quite brilliant. And I'm not against uh, other diets as much as I'm, and I'm not just one way and singularly thinking, you know, very myopic in terms of this is the only diet. So I take care of vegetarians, vegans, uh, paleo, I mean, you name it to just the SAD, the standard American diet. And so I'm a student of the game. That's where my position comes from. But I've had to do my own experimenting and I do my own experimenting before I start, you know, taking care of patients with that, I, I, it's just not my style to just jump into something and throw it at them before my my own research. I I have to understand what's going on with it. I have to know the ins and the outs, the where it's going to the pitfalls and where there's possibility for success. So in this case, I've been um, involved with ketogenic diet for about eight months and very hardcore ketogenic for the last. Uh, I've actually been intermittent fasting uh, for more like probably 20 months now, almost two years. And what I've learned from intermittent fasting is that I was already putting my body toward ketosis and I was in a ketogenic state quite often, but not fully fat adapted. So what does that even mean? Um, There's generalizations that are going on with this diet right now. It's very, it's, it's trending. It's the top trending diet right now uh, in the United States and arguably beyond our borders. But the point is um, there's certainly myths out there. For example, uh, Jillian Michaels has recently just declared on, on, on the air that she thinks it's a bad idea. Well, she's not my health expert, um, nor, nor would she be because uh, it, I don't have anything against her. It's nothing personal against her either, but she has her agenda in her business and with her uh, career, and that makes a whole lot of sense uh, to the fitness industry that um, people can lose weight without exercising is a bad idea for them. Now, that's not necessarily the the out I'm giving her. What I'm saying actually more more accurately is I, I don't I don't think she's – unaware of the benefits of ketogenesis. I don't think she's able to say or make any claims that it works because that would uh, that would interfere with what she's involved with. Let's put it that. So again, this is not about her. That's just an example of what creates confusion for listeners. And the first thing she said was, it's not a good idea, quote unquote, uh, or that it wasn't necessarily healthy. And And again, I'm paraphrasing, but that was pretty much the summation. And she implied it was like Atkins. Well, first of all, is is it bad for you? No, it's not bad for you in any way, shape, or form. It's bad. Any diet is bad when it's abused or misused or misunderstood. And this is one of those diets that's easily misunderstood because when you hear the word fat and you've been programmed our whole life, my whole life, it was a low-fat industry. Thank God my mom didn't necessarily buy into that. We used real butter and we used, um, we had fat in our lives and yet we remain lean. And the point is, um, in this process, your body is like your brain is the majority of it is fat. Your liver makes cholesterol, which is an important piece in creating hormones and creating, um, the fat that insulates your nerves, which is about conductivity. It's just like an insulation and wire, the bigger, thicker, Insulated wires are the ones that actually allow the most electricity to go through the biggest power tools, so to speak, versus the little bitty ones that you don't want to overload. Same thing with our wires in our in our nervous system. The greater the amount of fat we can produce around those nerves, the higher the conductivity, the faster they fire, the more efficient they are. So enough about that. But the point is, 
the ketogenic diet has many health benefits, but let's just clarify where it does like lead towards stumbling blocks. It's it's bad for you when you just start putting fat on top of your diet right now the way it is. Okay, that's bad. That's bad probably if you're an American because you're already consuming carbs. Now your body's just going to have more calories and you're going to have to store more fat. What people miss is the the mechanism behind what ketosis actually is. Just calorically shifting gears from your carbohydrate intake and refraining from that, your body's going to is so used to burning sugar. Okay, that's what you've been training it to do is spike insulin, spike insulin, spike insulin. And when you do that, you start to become insulin resistant. And insulin resistance is what leads towards ill health and inflammatory diseases such as cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, brain diseases, inflammation, arthritic conditions, which is degenerative disc disease, joint disease. Um, You can have autoimmune disorders as a result of the inflammation and the gut problems that you have. All that stems around inflammation, insulin, and cortisol. And by the way, insulin and cortisol are not bad hormones. They're they're good hormones your body creates. It's just that we're overusing them or overtaxing them with a diet high in grains and carbohydrates. Refined carbohydrates is the real key here versus all carbohydrates. So we want healthy carbohydrates in our diet like broccoli, uh, cauliflower. You, you can have zucchini, different squash. You can have uh, periodically um, sweet potatoes. You just you want to limit, it, it, obviously, greens, kale, spinach, parsley. You can have all those. And what you, what you don't want to do is you just don't want to use the refined carbs. But what happens is, again, the abuse is where it becomes a problem. And that's you're not changing the refined carbohydrates, and now you're just adding fat on top of it. That creates a lot of problems. There was also the implication around this, is it healthy, that it was implied that it was more like Atkins. Atkins was not enough vegetables, and that was about weight loss as well, which it succeeded at, but then the body arguably became too acid, acidic or uh, creating acidosis. For one, that is not the same thing as ketoacidosis, all right? So ketoacidosis is what gets categorized as a high risk for those who have type 1 diabetes. So if you have type 1 diabetes you are at risk in a ketogenic diet because you can go into ketoacidosis. Your body in the type 1 cannot control the amount of fat that flows through the bloodstream. They can't get rid of it, can't put it anywhere. So that's the problem. You go into an acidic state, that's a challenge. It's, 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 um, it's grave if that happens. So again, we're not talking to type 1 diabetics for ketogenesis. Just want to be clear on that. However, type 2 diabetics can and do respond very well and have great success when managed with the ketogenic diet because you're stopping the insulin spiking. You're starting, and then when, once you start waking up your fat burning cells, not only are you going to lose weight and deflame or reduce inflammation in the body, your hormone balance starts to go, you start to balance them more. Your insulin is not spiking so much, so you're not storing, you're not firing off so much cortisol. The inflammation in the body is dropping considerably, like giant drops in inflammation because you're not feeding it this acid sugar, uh, which is basically refined carbohydrates, which kick off inflammatory responses in the body. So once you get that concept, then it's it's hugely successful. It reduces your risk of cardiovascular disease when it's done correctly, I'll say. Um, you're going to improve brain function. You're going to improve biomarkers. You're going to have, you know, short term, you're going to show triglycerides going up in your bloodstream because you start mobilizing fat, which means that means if you have fat in your cell, you have fatty tissue and you're trying to lose weight, okay, anyone overweight, and you shift gears, you stop burning sugars, you know, and you stop the refined carbs, you eat about 10%. Let's go over these numbers real quick. 75, 10, 10, or 75, 10, and 15. 75% fat, calorically speaking, for your caloric value for the day. 10% protein, which is about 6 grams per, per, per meal. And you're getting about 10 to 15 grams or uh, percent carbs, percent of carbs. 
So 75 fat, 10 protein or 15 protein, and then 10 carbs or 15 carbs. So it's either you're just going to alternate the protein and the fat, whether you do 10 or 15, based on what you want to accomplish, whether it's working out. It, it, what, what I'm really saying is you fine-tune it towards what and what works best for you. But the key is the majority of your caloric intake is going to be fat because that's your fuel source, and then you feed and nourish your body with the others as well. So there's another myth in here about the brain. You know, the brain can't burn ketones. First of all, it's false. The brain can burn lipids. The brain can burn uh, what the brain prefers. You're still going to get some glucose, but your body is going to burn it once you activate and you become fat adapted or f- yeah, fat adapted or keto adapted. First of all, how long does that take? It takes about four to six weeks to make that transition. So you're burning sugar stores, you're you're weeding out the sugar sources in your in your body, and now you're eating cleaner and cleaner, but I still don't recommend you up, up, up your fats yet. And again, that's a big misunderstanding. When I'm in the restaurant and I see someone to the left of me and to the right of me and they're both talking about keto experiences, whether it be them or themselves or a friend or a family member, and it's like yeah, all over the place, I can guarantee that there's a misunderstanding in the application because you're either adding fats on top of your current diet, which is a bad idea we talked about, or you're not digesting fats well, which is the next myth, which is the bloating. Uh, that you bloat and you don't feel good. So I tried ketogenic and I didn't feel good. I was bloated all the time. It's like, well, you're not digesting fat. That's not going to work. You're absolutely right. But that doesn't mean the diet is bad. It means you got to improve your fat digestion. That is a key because no matter, you're, you're still bloated outside of the ketogenic diet. It's just to the degree. So I have not seen a case where folks can't get through some of that stuff and that's where we you know specifically work with enzymes uh, a whole nother topic but that is the myth the myth is that you, it doesn't you're not going to feel good i'm not going to argue with that person may not be feeling good but that is a solvable problem and it's very common for someone who has gallbladder stress whether they've either had a complete gallbladderectomy pulled out they're not going to digest fats well and they've never been told by their medical doctor to modify their diet because the liver does produce some bile and it will continue to produce bile. But your liver's responsible for pretty close, it's 500 things. I mean, do you want to give it any more work? I mean, most Americans drink alcohol, which means you're juggling that. You're, you're doing liver damage in, in small amounts every time. And so, I mean, your liver is amazing. But it's true that there is a breaking point with it. So we talk about fatty liver and is ketogenic, you know, bad for fatty liver? Does it cause fatty liver? There's other issues that are going on with fatty liver, but can it, uh, can it aggravate and accentuate if you don't digest? Of course, because now the liver's already burdened from other stressors and now you're going to burden it with fat digestion with already some issues around fatty digestion. So it doesn't mean it takes you out of the game. It means you got to be smarter with it. And that's what we call keto smart. You got to be smarter about how you approach it to the point where you, first of all, just understand what is ketosis. Well, ketosis is, which again is very different than ketoacidosis. So again, ketoacidosis, we clarified was type 1 diabetes. But we're not all at that risk unless unless you are type 1 diabetes. Ketosis just means you have fat ketones in the blood. Okay, and there are times that you're going to have fat in the blood when you're not even trying, of course, because you're you're digesting or you're processing metabolic fats. So how do you know it's actually a good thing or a bad thing? Well, where's your diet? If you're transitioning from carbs and you ruled them out and now you're you're burning fat because you're losing losing weight, your body says, hey, I need fuel somewhere, and if you're not going to give me the sugar – Fine, I got some sources here. I'm going to give you a little feedback at first and show you how ticked off I am because I'm con- I've, I've not had to wake this thing up. But at the same time, I have the machinery. So a little wine, a little grunt, a little sugar cravings, a little orneriness, and you're uptight for maybe a couple days or a week or a, a few hours. It's different for everybody. And then all of a sudden, your body just starts burning fat. 
it just starts clicking in and it's going to it's going to get more efficient at it so to be keto adapted fat adapted 4 to 6 weeks to really make that transition and when you get through that hump it's tremendous it's the energy is great the brain functions better you're going to find you're you're going it, to it's easier to go periods without food so all that starts to work if you start to get bloated as you start needing more fuel and energy and you're like, I'm hungry when it comes time to eat, your 75% of your calories are fat and then you're finding bloat. Or you can palpate the, the temples in about half an inch back bilaterally on both sides and there's going to be the temporalis muscle area there. You're going to find that it's rigidly tension, it's tense and or painful. It doesn't have to be painful as long as there's tension there. That's called involuntary muscle contraction. And that usually that will happen within 60 to 90 minutes after you eat. So you can run your own test on yourself. After you increase some fat in your diet, watch what happens. You can palpate there. And then you can also go up under, so find the sternum, drop down just below it. That's your stomach. Slide to the right about two inches and then down along the ribs there, just underneath the ribs. If you just hook your fingers under a little bit and press up and under, any resistance in that tissue, tenderness or tension, as again, involuntary muscle contracture, indicating the gallbladder is working harder than normal, inflamed, however you want to look at it. There's an inflammation there and there's tension, and that means you're, you're struggling to digest those fats. You could have thick bile. You could have stones. You could have uh, a gallbladder that's failing. I mean, you have to look at it and understand that's what fats are going to burden those areas. If you rule out that those areas are involved, then, again, always seek the advice of your doctor, of course, because I'm not trying to give you health care advice from here. But the reality is in the education of this, um, you, can, you can test and then move forward. If you have questions, seek the health care of a doctor. Uh, but if your doctor has no clue about this, find a new doctor. That's – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be frank there. If you want to move towards health instead of just treating diseases and symptoms and conditions, find a new doctor. Look at things functionally. All right. So when people feel bloat, that's usually why that happens. They're not digesting and they're not, they're not chewing well. They're not creating enough uh, lipase or they, they lack lipase enzymes that actually can help break down. And their biliary function is, is already under duress and adding more fats puts it even further it doesn't work for weight loss not true that myth when people lose five to eight pounds and then hit a ceiling is back towards not digesting fats very well they start to make a transition the body says hey okay this is new and it, it loses some water it loses maybe a little bit of fat but struggles to keep that process going because as the increases fats come in the body gets bloated the digestive system and the colon are stressed and strained, so it starts to get sluggish and backed up. And you're right, it doesn't feel good, and it's not going to work in terms of weight loss. But again, that has to do with digesting and, and helping enzymes and actually then fine-tuning the fat to make sure that, A, when you get it, you're digesting it, and B, that you're not adding too much. So if you're already leaned down, you can start to modify your diet to keep your weight where it is. But if you're still trying to lose weight, then you really got to start addressing uh, specifically look for lipase enzymes. I'm not sure how much I can give you uh, as far as information on specifically what we use in our office right now. So I'll throw a link uh, in for Dr. Howard Loomis. Um, he wrote a book called The Enzyme Advantage for Healthcare Providers and People Who Care About Their Health, as well as Enzymes, The Key to Health. Uh, great books, great clarification, uh, that is a key into how we get our – anybody chiro keto uh, who's had a gallbladderectomy or has sluggish gallbladder or who has fat digestive issues, we get them succeeding by helping them support healthy digestion in those fashions. Disclaimer, we're not treating any conditions or diseases. Uh, we do not treat gallbladder conditions. We, we work with the body in terms of supporting healthy physiology. Yes, that's a must say when big pharma happens to influence everything in own words such as inflammation. They they own the word. I know that's fascinating. That brings us to number four, uh, which is those who 
like to be in the gym, gym rats, uh, bodybuilders, weightlifters, those who think, uh, or athletes that are just performance athletes, they f- tend to feel that there's this need to have high carbs uh, and that you have to have high carbs to be able to compete. So can athletes actually maintain a diet high in fat and low in carbohydrate for extended periods of time? The answer simply is an emphatic yes, but the chances that you uh, can stick with it and experience success depends on, one, your mindset going in and also the quality of the advice you receive on how to formulate your diet. Which brings me back to being keto smart, being keto sensitive, keto aware of what that is. Again, my outcome, little caveat, is that ketosis is the byproduct of healthy eating and changing your metabolism. It's not, it's rebooting your metabolism. So when you stop burning sugar and you start burning fat, you change your metabolism. And that is a medical, you're a metabolic fat burning machine as a result of that. That's the goal. So from a weight loss and regaining health perspective, that's why I'm such a proponent for ketogenesis. Not that everyone needs to be ketosis all the time, because I don't agree with that either. It's can you drift in and out of ketosis and can you adapt? Are you fat adapted more than your sugar adapted? That's where the health benefits lie. Not that you're always in ketosis. All right. It's just like fasting. It's good in periods, but it's also good to mix your body up to to keep your body adapting and not do the same thing over and over and over. For example, 16 hour, 16 hour, 16 hour intermittent fast at the same time, same schedule, same schedule, because what you're doing is you're you're going to your body theoretically will again compensate and slow metabolism down now that it's because again it's being trained so it's just going to find that cruising level that's why we want to shift and mix it up a bit um so it's it's basically false that you need these carbs loading and carb glycogen stores to have great workouts number one i can profess to this because i have great workouts great energy and i'm going in in a fasted state and i'm in ketosis and I have plenty of uh, strength and endurance, and I'm not fatiguing. I'm having great workouts. I'm still getting growth in the muscle. I'm getting um, – I, I feel like I'm just getting a good workout as well. And then when I replenish branched-chain amino acids or a healthy protein, for me it's grass-fed uh, protein. I'll, I'll put a link on there too, which would my favorite, which one I use. Uh, but again, there's there's tons of them out there. There's some great ones out there. You just got to find out what works best for you and how clean you actually want to be. We could open up more dialogue in this, but I don't want to drag this out in your case. I mean, that that could be another episode when we talk to some athletes and trainers. Uh, I'll get Dr. Mike Vander Sheldon on again, and we'll talk specifically about athletic performance and, and why intermittent fasting along with ketosis and ketogenesis actually is just like huge uh, in the gym in terms of talk about being lean and ripped and muscular and strong. Or if you're 50, 55 and you just, hey, you had a great physique or you want to just be strong and have muscle mass, that's all part of the equation. It's this balance. It's it's a balance between enough muscle mass and that remaining tone and strong and adaptive versus just letting your body wither away and you're not we're not using it but we're feeding it all this acid all the time which are refined carbs number five number five is basically that more fat good this is a quote more fat good no um versus healthy fats no it's not true just more fat isn't good. So you're going to see people say, "Oh yeah, I just eat more bacon now, and I'm, you know, I eat, you know, prime rib with the fat, and I eat, um, you know, a porterhouse or a New York strip, and, and I get more fat, or whatever it is." What I'm, what I'm hearing from all that is number one, you don't, you can't control the fat sources. So fat tissue has toxins in it. You want to look for not only grass-fed, grass-finished. You want to look for pasture-raised pork if you're going to have that, vegetation-fed. You're going to look at healthy, clean meats, okay? You can't use highly processed or incorporated meats. You want to use some um, naturally raised, grass-fed, grass-finished beef, pork, chicken, pasture-raised, healthy meat sources. And when you get fat... You got to understand the more fat you get from meat, the less you're controlling those toxins. So you want your fats to be more vegetable related, such as avocado oil, avocados. Um, you want raw eggs. You want eggs with the cholesterol in there. You want healthy uh, raised eggs organically. 
healthy wild-caught fish that have high omega-3s. Um, but again, you want to watch out for your heavy metals. That's usually in the belly region of the fish, but yet we're going to get some in other parts as well. Grass-fed butters, goat cheese. Um, I have keto folks that are dairy-free, so we don't use the cheeses, but we use grass-fed butter. They're okay with some grass-fed butter and or ghee. Um, and so you got nuts in there. You got macadamia nuts, pecans, walnuts. You can use things. You just got to be careful with the lectins and cashews and peanuts. But again, nut butters can be okay too. It's just in moderation where you do that. But you want to look at those healthy fats. That's where the caloric intake is going to be your most. But again, make sure you can digest them. So the ultimate answer is more fat, good, no. It's specific healthy fats that are good and making sure you're digesting them. That is the key. So hopefully you would learned something from these five top very common myths, and hopefully we've de- helped debunk them. I-, I gave you a bunch of opinion around it too because I deal with this every day. Um, there's plenty of research out there, but again, if you just do a quick search on the internet, you're going to find these just kind of generic answers to them. Uh, and we went much more in depth as to why and, and tried to give you at least a little meat around the understanding of, first of all, what ketosis is and what ketoacidosis is, the difference. And ketosis in the majority of the population is what we're after, not ketoacidosis. That's in type 1 diabetics. So they're, they're disqualified. They don't, they don't belong here in a ketogenic talk. Type 2, yes. Cardiovascular, yes. Um, inflammation of the body, yes. Overweight, yes. All those apply and do really well with the ketogenic diet. And always seek the help of a doctor if you want help or you, you know, you're considering a ketogenic diet and look at all those factors, but ask questions. And I'm going to uh, reiterate, if your doctor doesn't have the knowledge, then either find a new doctor that does. You want somebody who's an expert in understanding what this is. For example, uh, I have a healthcare team that I work with that takes care of me as well and I have tests done and I get other opinions and and I'm monitoring all these things and I'm making sure that that I have a good team managing me and it's quite fascinating to find a lot of knowledge in one area over here but not much around the big picture with it so they're experts in this niche and that niche over here and and what I'm finding is it, it's just it's human nature right their specialty is is in their specialty but the myth about even within providers was that it's very acidic and i'm like not the way i'm doing it not the way i'm teaching it the way we teach it is keto smart is actually more alkalizing alkaline supporting but again homeostasis this is a this is another episode look for this upcoming where we discuss homeostasis and what is always going on behind the scenes and and what your body's already doing and which is why we want to understand that it's there, but also support it. But we're, we don't have to manipulate it. We don't have to force it one way or another. We literally just support what it's trying to do. And when you do that, you're now honoring what your body is naturally going to be good at. So this wraps up another episode, and I hope you found huge value. I would love your questions. I would love any uh, questions you have about whether it be ketogenesis, a keto diet right for you, Uh, whether there's a myth that you need more clarification on, whether you want a whole new topic. That would be awesome. I'd love to hear from you. As always, I just want to thank you so much for listening to this week's episode, and I look forward to our next time. Okay, my fellow health warriors, it's time to head over to iTunes, frankly speaking, drwade.com. There, you can rate, review, and subscribe, as well as share, so more of our brothers and sisters can grow to realize their voice and their health. Speaking up means you matter. We'll see you next time.